Well, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Curry, who's a private practitioner, senior clinician with Eastern Health, conjoint senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Newcastle. That's in New South Wales, is it not, of course? You've worked clinically for 20 years with angry children. Doesn't like prisoners of the adult kind. Well, they're another sort of prisoner. Adolescents and mm. adults in a wide variety of private community and mental health settings. You consult widely to professional schools and community organisations across Australia. Michael Curry, would you please speak to us? Thanks for your welcome. So Alan is a 13-year-old boy who's teased in a school playground by his school friends regarding his sexual preferences. And he reacts quickly and angrily and pulls a metal ruler from his bag and hacks into the necks of his classmates so badly that uh, one requires admission to hospital. And Alan has a tearful, remorse-filled encounter with the deputy principal of his school and later the deputy principal, who's clearly the angry one now, in his report to me says, he's a very nice boy, but he just won't do what he says he will. This is Alan's last chance. If you can't help him control his anger and this happens again, he's going to be expelled. So unlike the majority of his peers, even the threat of dire consequences from the principal don't have much effect in helping Alan stay inside the school rules of reasonable conduct. And later on, when I start to meet with Alan, he reveals that he couldn't stand that someone else thought he was a faggot and that the classmates who were teasing him seemed so smug and self-satisfied that he felt he had to strike at them. Now, Alan's not alone here. We all carry with us, uh, with us a more or less conscious idea of a unified image of ourselves, a sense of who we are as individuals. When this sense is attacked or threatened by someone who seems far more successful or beautiful or rich than us, or by someone who directly challenges us regarding our competence, our authority and the like, it's likely to destabilise this coherent image of ourselves. Our peers act as a sort of a mirror. We tend to think negatively about those peers who reflect the negative image of ourselves. And in some cases, we can think that our own self-image is threatened with disintegration. It seems we might fall apart in comparison to these strong and competent others who are reflecting something back to us. Anger, and sometimes the resulting aggression, can be seen as, as an assertion of our own self-image above how we think someone else is devaluing us. In short, anger is a statement. I am not wrong about myself. So despite its objectionable consequences, Alan's angry aggression can be seen as a protective act, attacking the unity or the wholeness of those whose taunts threaten him with disintegration. So within angry individuals, the fundamental psychic tendencies can be very different to the face that they show to the world. Rather than the aggressive, swaggering, tough cowboy we might expect, he's got his six suitors ready, we find a boy who's fragile and vulnerable and reliant on the constant affirmations of those around him. Anger has an important protective function against sadness and despair. In this sense, Anger is not just a problem, but it is also a solution. I promised uh, our technician that I wouldn't get angry about the technology here tonight. Mm -hmm. And I nearly did because it was, I put it upside down and I was told, <laughs> don't put it upside down. So, ah. so anger and madness. Why did Alan hit his friends? Because he was angry. We've become so used to using anger as an explanation for human action that in some ways I think we've become blind and deaf to the insanity of the thoughts and acts associated with anger. In Alan's case, what does hitting someone say about the status of his sexual preferences? Very little in my view. The madness is explained away by this protective function I was talking about before. So rather than saying because he was angry, Alan hit his friends because he was protecting himself. So whilst the need for Alan to psychically protect himself provides an explanation, in the context of the school's um, rules and Alan's serious disagreements with the principal, his act remains mad in that it is self-destructive. Um, and Alan knows that. And many of the teenage boys who I've, tried to, who I've treated 
that's an interesting slip who I've tried to treat, because there's some who I've tried to treat and failed. Um, concur with Seneca's definition that I have on the overhead here. Seneca's definition of anger is a madness. They confirm it by their own descriptions of anger as going sick, going psycho, losing it, having a spaz attack or going wild. Now, when Seneca describes anger as a temporary madness, I agree that he's using this as a metaphor, as Andrew pointed out before. But he's also proposing not just a metaphor, but also putting forward a mechanism of anger. And the mechanism I propose is as follows. Anger causes a physiological arousal, which is aversive and difficult to tolerate. The fundamental inference of anger, I've been hurt, so I must hurt him, provides an action urge which is very hard to resist. So the arousal of the body, together with trying to resist this action urge, can lead to a momentary failure of the metaphorical capacity of language. We can't find the words to strike back. Anger presents a problem. And perhaps sometimes we can find the words to strike back. Or at other times we have the words and we swallow hard. A bit like um, perhaps what the two gentlemen you described, Andrew, might do. Alan, full of rage and physiological arousal after being stung by the words of his friends, cannot find the words, otherwise known as metaphors, to hit back. And so he responds to his own physical arousal via a physical act, bypassing speech. And I'd argue that it's the failure to speak that lends anger its intensity and ferocity. In short, it's madness, after Seneca. One treatment principle I follow in helping boys like Alan is to assist them to try and find the words where previously they could not. This means his anger can become less madly self-destructive and can act as a fuel for the imprecise art, imprecise art of speech, or in Robin's case, or should I call you Victor, in uh, Robin's case, the art of writing. Moving to anger and sin. For Alan, his problem seemed to be that the teasing of classmates in the schoolyard easily smashed his ideas about himself. That he was very vulnerable to this accusation of being homosexual. In addition, his view of himself was influenced in the next moment by the wrath of his school's deputy principal, where he quickly switches from being angry to being remorseful. So this permeability to others' views of him tosses him between anger and remorse with little prospect of him being able to determine what he wants or what he thinks is the right way to behave or act. These are very difficult questions to answer. Who am I? What do I want? And they're often only answered by any of us, partially and provisionally. But in Alan's case, his permeability to others means that he's always looking towards what others want of him or provoking him, rather than what he might want for himself. So given the protective function of anger that I mentioned before, it's perhaps less easy to condemn anger or wrath as a moral sin if we take morality as a code provided externally by a religion, an institution or a public discourse. And it's perhaps only the act that follows anger, aggression, that is um, covered by morality. And in fact, the angered person, for the angered person, the opposite is true. Anger tends to feel one with moral certitude. But anger is perhaps better viewed as a moment of ethical confusion. If we take ethics to be an internal set of reference points, principles or wishes. And if I push this idea just a little further, anger is not a moral sin, but an ethical sin. As anger can direct us to forsake our own internal principles in favour of blaming others. What I'm, in what I'm proposing, ethical responsibility is incompatible with a moral blame of others. So those who currently blame the others who populate their world with the troubles of their own soul, these people face many problems. I've come to call this tendency a paranoid habit of mind. The main features of a paranoid habit of mind are belief in the malevolence of others, everyone's out to get you, a dominance of this belief to the point where it's very difficult to reflect on how one is the author of one's own difficulties. And nor can one really think of ways to alter the problems that one finds oneself ensconced within. So when offering a treatment to an angry person, one hopes to help a patient move from this paranoid habit of mind to what we could call a critical reflective habit of mind. How does one do this? Well, I propose these three 
antidotes to anger, of which technology is not one. I, I think our technician helped us out. We should give them a round of applause because where I failed, the, te the technician helped. Okay. So how does one do this? I can't give the whole process, but there's these three antidotes. First, relationships. Rather than a belief in the malevolence of others, we might encourage angry boys to return to their relationships to sort them out, but not with a moral be nice to others aim in mind, but with an idea that others might actually be able to help them, to be of some use to them. Secondly, self-reflection. Angry people are often unable to reflect on what they've done to cause their problems. If the problem's out there, then the cause is out there. And there is an absence of thought about how in here might be implicated. So encouraging self-reflection is an important aspect of doing better when people are angry. Thirdly, agency. If the problem's out there, then so is the solution. Fundamentally, in my view, being angry is a passive act, despite all the bluster, threat and aggression. It leaves the angered one without the means to do something about the problem, him or herself. The solution is always directed towards another, usually via intimidation or blame. It's about someone else doing something rather than me doing something. Encouraging or finding means of acting or creating independence is an important in the treatment of anger. So in my treatment of angry boys in schools, I try to encourage a focus on these three so-called antidotes to anger. One method we use, or that I've ten invented, I guess, is to use percussion, Latin American percussion. It's a particular game I use to illustrate how I do this tonight called Mapping Anger. In this game, a boy describes an event where he becomes angry. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll just wave, OK? <laughs> I'll shake my fist. That's what I'll do. Um, we encourage a boy to um, describe an event where he became angry, usually to with his fears, peers. Um, and I use this slip fears rather than peers because I'm getting more fearful about this little box here that it's going to dominate me sooner or later. We do it very simply by tick, tick boxes because a lot of the boys who I work with, despite being adolescents, often are not very literate. Um, if we can move on to the next, um, next. So I invite him to make a graph of the rise and fall of his anger on a whiteboard. This shows how angry he was before, during and after his anger. How did he know he was angry? Heartbeat, a loud voice, sweaty palms, racing thoughts. These are all possible candidates for a boy's anger sign. He then chooses some peers to play this anger episode on the drums. So a boy might choose a deep bass drum for his heart rate, a high-pitched snare drum for his loud and racing thoughts of attack, and so on. And the boy then plays his anger to and with the assistance of his peers. So by talking about drawing and then playing his anger in this manner, it is as if a boy has made a declaration to his peers. My anger is mine. Despite his being commonly unaware of this declaration at first, this percussion exercise counter the, counters the other blaming aspect of anger. It's everyone else's fault. Rather, this anger is to do with me. And boys in the groups that I run at schools commonly take a lot of interest in their anger following this exercise. Secondly, in regards to this, symbolising anger with percussion helps boys take the first steps in talking about their inner experience. Anger is, to most people, an adversive emotion. Adversive emotion. It means those who experience high levels of tension and arousal and anger tend to want to just forget about it rather than speak about the anger eliciting events. Percussion, that I use a lot in the groups um, that I work with in schools, acts, percussion acts as a bridge between the body's arousal and the means to think and talk about the anger. So said another way, this encourages boys to reflect on the madness of anger that I mentioned before. A madness that inhabits the body. The percussion game links the angered body with speech and thought. And this promotes a move away from a blaming moral mode of thinking about the wrongdoing of others, that's very characteristic of angry people, and a move towards an ethical mode of understanding defined as being reflective of how one has acted within the social context. To finish, um, I just summarise this shift from morals to ethics by a quote from Aristotle from his Nicomachean Ethics. Oh, it didn't work. 
<laughs> Anyone can get angry, that is easy. But to do this to the right person, to the right extent, at the right time, with the right aim and in the right way, that is not for everyone, nor is it easy. And that is what goodness is, rare and noble. And Aristotle wrote this uh, about three and a half thousand years ago, I believe. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me about the percussion game. What does it involve? What does it involve? Um, well, as I explained, basically the... Um, well, percussion itself in the, in the groups that I run in schools, commonly angry boys, when they get... If you picture eight or ten boys in a room together, often the language that they use is very destructive and competitive. And there's a game we play straight off where... Um, which is called um, Meeting the Drums. And I get the biggest, shiniest, loudest looking drum and I ask boys, who wants to play this? And three boys put their hand up, of course. But then two boys seeing another boy that's put their hand up, put their hands down. And clearly I've done an assessment of the boys in the group. There is the bully. Now, what will happen is no one will want to talk about that. But then I'll say, Johnny and Timmy, why did you put your hands down? I oh, no reason, it's fine. No, no worries, mm. it's fine. So you're really happy for, for Bert to have it. But why? I sort of saw Bert go like that. These are often the first sort of steps I use to try and put words to what's unspoken. Because whenever power dominates a group, that is um, corrosive towards language. And what we're trying to do is create a linguistic culture in the group. So the drums act as a sort of economy to get boys to start talking. We play this game and pretty soon after that, a few um, groups after that, we play this mapping anger game which I described. And that is really a way where we try to turn this, combat this um, other blaming aspect of anger. It's all the world out there. It's all the teacher's fault. It's all my dad's fault. It's all everyone else's fault. Not me. Hmm. Not me. But it's very interesting. Um, this thought came to me when a Andrew was talking. When I asked boys, do you like being angry? Almost universally, their answer is no. Yeah. And that is the key point of engagement for them to come into this group that I come to the school with. It doesn't look so bad. It's not a group about anger. It's a group where you play drums. And so, in some ways, it puts aside the stigma that many of these boys suffer when they go to see the psychologist or go to the health clinic. What I wanted to do was to take the clinic to the school and dress up the wolf in sheep's clothing. The aftermath, yeah, the aftermath of anger can be exhausting and also you go over it again and again you relive it <laughs> you think about it yes and so you pay for it and they are aware of that are they um i'd say what boys do as a result of my work in the groups of them is they become aware of it so there's a couple of very specific exercises i use in groups you can imagine if you get eight to ten aggressive boys together pretty soon there's going to be a problem. You know, for the first 15 minutes it's always yes sir, no sir, three bags, full, full sir. But then after that there's a problem. Someone's going to want to hit someone or... Sw and the idea with that I use this exercise called It's Hot. I call it very, use it very simple terms where... And I always work with another therapist where there's a conflict between bo two boys. And when the conflict emerges we freeze what's going on in the group. One therapist goes to one boy, another therapist goes to the other boy. And the therapist acts as a sort of speech coach, rather than saying this is what's going on, tries to get the boy to speak in the face of this terrible arousal he's feeling in himself. And th there's a lot of evidence to show um, that in groups, what tends to happen with anger is it gets swept under the carpet. The time to work with anger is at its moment that it's been felt, that's when it's most effective, because otherwise the group closes it over and tries to just survive anything that threatens the group. Have you examined, had the time to examine the long-term effectiveness of what you do? Um, only for six, six months, um, six months follow-up. And I, one of the interesting things, I was going to put it, I've got it up on the overhead, I, I should uh, put it up, but one of the interesting things we did was we followed it up for three terms. It's probably more like nine months. We found that in the, for each term, school term, following the one term where we did these therapy groups, that boys' anger the number of times they were aggressive in school 
fell by about 10 to 15 per cent every term to the point where by third term the number of aggressive incidents they were perpetrating in school was 20 per cent of the three terms prior to the therapy group. Now the good thing about that is that it's probably not a very, psychologists don't like these sort of measures because they're hard to control but it's a very what we call ecological measure because it's a social fact that if a boy gets into trouble in school and gets reported for it, like Alan, they very quickly get kicked out of school. And we know very well from a lot of studies that for every year a boy can stay at school, that lowers his risk for negative outcomes later on in life. Which leads to my last question. What would you feel about taking Andrew's job? How reluctant would you be to go to the NIC and deal with grown-ups? Well, I, I, I have... I haven't gone to the NIC, but I have, uh, de have dealt with convicted offenders. I was talking, Andrew and I were talking about this beforehand, and it's probably, there's a reason why I work with adolescents and not with offenders, because I think uh, working with the sort of boys I work with, 12 to 15 year old boys who are on the verge of expulsion from school, is the last time where you can really say the intervention's preventive, that you're trying to prevent a catastrophic future un unfurled. For Ronnie and Lawrence, the catastrophic future has already come. And I th thought your questions you asked about Ronnie and Lawrence were, they have crossed to the other side. The questions you asked were very pertinent because what can one do when you've crossed to the other side of the law? For me, uh, I feel that there's a, f for adolescents, there's still something to be lost and that's a future. And so I feel much more comfortable working with that. In the times I have worked with offenders, um, I find the work far more difficult and stand in admiration of Andrew doing that very difficult work because not many people want to do it. It's true not many people want to work with angry boys either because, um, be, because they're very quickly uh, alienated and marginalised from school as well. But if it's possible to stop them leaving school too early, then perhaps something of a future for them is still possible. Thank you, Michael. I was thinking, Michael, I quite like your job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not swapping. <laughs> Swaps on. <laughs>